students along the way through their town by coding, dash robots, and completing multiplication tasks at each stop. The activity showcased students' problem solving, coding, and math skills, and it was great work by the fourth graders. The kindergarten classes will be working with Lori Hippert, the instructional technology specialist, at a lesson in January called Keyboard Phonics um, through a phonics game, and it has been awesome seeing the various grade levels engaging in these lessons. A special thanks to the Lincoln Street PTO and families for treating staff to a wonderfully delicious cookie event. Each staff member headed off for the holidays with a variety box of homemade treats. Um, Lincoln Street gathered as a school community for a holiday sing-along. It was a festive way to kick off the winter break, and they're looking forward to a healthy start to 2023. At Proctor, the third graders brought good cheer and well wishes to the North Borough Senior Center. On December 20th, the third graders, under the direction of general music teacher Ms. Burns, caroled for the North Borough Seniors. The Proctor fourth graders and Mrs. Dowd's class have been hard at work during their enrichment period preparing for the play Bebop with ASAP. The fourth graders will present the school present to the school and families on January 19th. Um, on January 19th, the Worcester County DA's office will visit Proctor and present to the fourth and fifth graders on bullying, cyberbullying, and how to safely navigate online apps, games, and platforms. We look forward to this informative presentation and applying what we learned to make safe and responsible choices. The four elementary schools are looking forward to band and chorus concerts at the end of the, uh, at the end of January. Our young musicians have been hard at work preparing to showcase all that they have accomplished and learned since the start of the school year. The students have spent months learning the material and are eager to share their efforts with families. The Proctor School will end the month of January with a winter concert on the 25th. The band and chorus students have been preparing for months and are eager to share their talents with the school and families. Um, at Peasley, we welcomed fourth grade families to the annual Cookies and Cocoa on the evening of December 21st. Fourth graders shared their singing talents, artwork, and poetry during this wonderful family event. Second graders shared their heritage product, pro projects on November 28th. This was a wonderful experience to research and share the annual traditions and holidays among our families. All students and teachers worked hard preparing for these special community events. Peasley students enjoyed Peasley, celebrating Peasley's 60th anniversary with a Peace, Love, and Spirit Day on December 23rd. Students and staff spent time sharing the meaning of living in peace and harmony while spreading kindness and respect to one another. Every Spirit Day throughout the year is paired with a food drive supporting the Northborough Food Bank. Students and their families were very gracious this month. The next Spirit Day is Crazy Hair Day on January 27th. First graders at Peasley will, will participate in the Sound Enrichment Program through, dis through the Discovery Museum on Friday, January 6th. Third grade will participate in the Force and Magnetism Enrichment on January 24th. These programs are a highlight for students and teachers. Peasley would like to thank the PTO for supporting the or and organizing these wonderful experiences. Peasley looks forward to our PTO-sponsored Winterfest on Friday, January 20th. The, the fun winter-themed social will include games, inflatables, arts and crafts, both indoor and outdoors for students and their families. We will also be sponsoring a Look What Peasley Can Do Together with a non-perishable food collection which will happen during the event. At Z, we held our December community meeting on, on the 9th. We read the book, The Sandwich Swap, and talked about how to create a lunchroom that is inclusive for all of our students with the help of our mascot, Stripes the Zebra. We also celebrated some of our students and staff that went above and beyond. During the month of December, we collected personal hygiene supplies as well as baby blankets, bottles, mittens, and hats in a drive to support the Family Health Center of Worcester. The items collected will help support local families in need during the winter months. The week before break was filled with fun. We had a spirit week, which included crazy socks, Z spirit, and my favorite, pajama day. Um, on the 20th, the PTO provided a breakfast for the staff, which was delicious. And on the 23rd, we held an all-school sing-along, which was a great way to close out 2022. Starting next week, our English language learners will be taking their state access test, um, which will assess their English language acquisition skills. Um, they think, I want to thank our ELD teachers for their work and create schedules for this to go smoothly. And also next week, our classroom teachers will begin administering mid-year assessments, um, and we will use that data to check our progress, update small groups, and help us map out our instruction for the second half of the year. At Mellican, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders auditioned for the upcoming musical Matilda Jr. before vacation, including the stage crew. They have 85 students participating in the production. Rehearsals take place from now until mid-March, with performances scheduled for March 17th and 18th at 7 p.m. at Algonquin. Um, the Boys and Girls 
basketball teams have had a successful start to their seasons. The girls team went into break with a 2-0 record, and the boys had a 3-0 record, but both teams suffered their first losses yesterday. And the students have been very supportive and positive. The winter concert series was a success with three concerts before vacation. Each concert was well attended, and the students were excited to share what they had learned. Millican raised over $1,200 through the Holiday Helper Initiative, and this money was donated to Northboro Helping Hands to support folks during the holiday season. We want to thank the PTO for the wonderful faculty and staff breakfast um, in December, and the English language learners will engage in access testing this month, and the teachers have worked hard to prepare to and to prepare and support the students. That's it. Amazing. Great. Any questions? Uh, any questions? I guess I'll just uh, yeah. comment. It's really great to hear all the community involvement that our young students have, um, just connecting them with like the nursing homes and things like that. So thanks for sharing that tonight. Great. Anyone? I'd just like to uh, take back to all the other principals, all the wonderful things they did, especially at the beginning when you talked about all the different celebrations because we're all multicultural and the children need to learn about so much about that. Like you said, it's always the light because it's the darkest day that we have um, in December. But um, it's wonderful to see also the collaboration with PTO helping out and, you know, thanking the teachers for everything that they did. So. And you did a great job on your first one, and many more to keep, many more to come. We'll give you a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you are welcome to stay or leave for the evening. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, legislative updates. So just a brief update on the. Um, out of district tuition costs, the 14% increase that OSD set as a targeted increase for fiscal year 24. So we have learned that most likely um, that will move to advocacy um, with our legislative delegation and potentially be impacted by circuit breaker. So the 14% is going to, is fixed is from what we've learned. Mm -hmm. And the way we can try to mitigate the 14% increase is by advocating for increased circuit breaker money. Um, so, so our advocacy, advocacy is just shifting. Uh, so we would advocate increased circuit breaker to reimbursement. Increase circuit breaker reimbursement. And would that be then forever or for the year? How is that? Do you know how they're? I'm not sure how okay. how that would be structured. I would imagine that the 14% is a one-time um, increase. So I would imagine that it would probably be a one-time um, increase in circuit breaker to accommodate. What else? Yes, John. Um, to advocate uh, to our legislators, they would. and even to our new governor as of 12 noon tomorrow? Yeah, I was going to say, I'm sure, is it, is there one? We did send a letter. Um, yeah. Previous. For the previous, for but I think that um, it's probably wise to resend it, mm -hmm. and I'll update the letter, and we can, we can co-sign it again. Yep. Thank you. And that is the legislative update. Um, approval of grants and donations. So we had a donation um, for a buddy bench for the playground at the Fannie E. Proctor School. And the donation came for the amount of $1,200, and it was from the Junior Women's Club and Private Citizens. Um, so I don't know if you have any more background about it. Was it requested? No, I think it was um a conversation I think it was generated actually from a group of students mm -hmm. uh, at recess mm -hmm. and working with principal Sear um, and the students they um, found the funding for a bench um, do, and you probably don't know if it's one or two because I know they have like an upper wing and a lower wing I'm just curious if it's I think it was I believe it's one one bench it's one bench yes. so maybe it's probably for the upper wing I see I feel like there's benches on the wing well, that is amazing. Thank you so much, the Northboro Junior Women's Club and Private Citizens, for that donation. Um, I will um, accept a motion to accept the donation. Yes, Joan. I move that we accept with great gratitude the donation uh, from the Junior Women's Club and the Private Citizens in the amount of $1,200 
for the body bench for the playground at the Fannie E. Proctor School. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion by Joan, seconded by Aaron. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you so much. And we will send out a lot of um, sure. appreciation for the donation. Great, thank you. Um, presentation cycle. We've talked about the different um, uh, cycle for the teaching and learning teams. And then also the PTOs? Correct. Okay. Yep. So in your packet is a draft um, cycle. Um, similar to uh, regional school districts where we have a rotation of content areas and departments presenting over a two-year cycle. Um, this mirrors that presentation cycle. I, I like having a structure because we can then communicate to our directors and um, our folks and, and have them pre be prepared to present. Mm -hmm. I like it for the PTOs as well coming from both sides of it, you know, for us to know mm -hmm. but also being on the PTO to know. Um, I know in previous years it's like, oh, next month, you know, you gotta put your stuff together. So I'm sure they will appreciate that too. Um, yeah, it looks good to me. I don't know, does anybody have any? Joan? Um, how is this communicated to the team leaders or to department heads? So um, the teaching and learning team primarily is responsible for many of these presentations. So mm -hmm. I think through Dr. Reinhorn, um, it will be communicated to yeah. those folks. Okay. I think it's a great idea because I think what was lacking for years I've been asking for these same type of presentations because I think they're very helpful. Um, as we do our budget cycles and everything, especially because we've always did it at the regional. So why don't we do it here? And I think it's great, and I think it's even good for the teaching staff so that they see it and the directors or anybody who wants to, or even the public or the principals, to see what's going to be happening. And just to, it's nice to have an overview of that and also to have the PTOs on the schedule, too. Thank you. And I just would comment that this is flexible, too. So if there is a need for a presentation or we need to adjust the schedule, it's the will of the committee to do it. Oh, that's good. <coughs> um, so it's looking like just to give a heads up for anyone listening that the Proctor and Peasley PTOs will be in March. And Z <coughs> will be in April and then May will be Melican and Lincoln. Just for those PTOs. And we'll send out a reminder, we'll send out a reminder we'll to the principals yes. and the PTOs. And then for the PTOs also, Aaron and I have been working on coming up with kind of a guidelines request um, for them. So they'll give us specific things that we'd like to hear about. All right. Thank you so much. Um, moving on. Next is the NEDP discussion. So Northbrook Extended Day Program has been a long-standing, um, privately run um, program that we have issued licensing agreements to over the years. Um, we are in conversations around whether it makes sense for the district to take on running the Extended Day Program. Um, at this point in time, our goal was to complete and conduct a study this year, 2022-2023. Um, um, but we really have not had the chance to conduct that study. And therefore, what our recommendation is at this point is to issue a one-year licensing agreement uh, to NEDP. So that would allow us time to conduct the study in 23-24 and make a recommendation to the school committee. Our goal would be in um, late fall of 23 to make a recommendation to the committee. That way we would have time, if it is the will of the committee and advantageous to the district to take on the program, that we would have time to transition January um, leading up to the, the start of the program. Right. I know that South Borough made that transition and they did a study before and we were sort of waiting to see how South Borough K-8 was mm -hmm. proceeding. How is that proceeding, and are we going to be looking at their results and 
see what they modeled. Yeah, I think that um, it's it's gone it's gone well, um, but it has been a transition and it has been additional work um, for the Southboro District and our central office team. Mm -hmm. um, we are glad that we've we made the, the transition um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but again, it, it, it's a significant endeavor, not one taken lightly. Mm -hmm. um, based on our initial experience, we're, we're, we want to get through a full year um, to, to make um, a final assessment. Um, but at this point in time, we're happy um, with the decision. Um, and that's why we're actually hoping to do a study in Northboro, see if it's advantageous to take it on mm -hmm. uh, in Northboro as well. Um, would you see that we would have to add on any staff to the financial to take care of? We would. Um, so the, the, the goal would be similar to the, the goal in South Bay, would be a self-funding program. So all costs would be through tuitions, mm -hmm. including health care. So there would be no additional Kind of like cafeteria. Costs, correct. Like it's, be, its own it'd be a, rolling account type correct, thing. Correct. Um, a self-sustaining program. Mm -hmm. But we would have to bring on staff to be able to um, run a program. Mm -hmm. Similar in Southboro, our, our thinking is that we have very talented any DP staff and if it was our decision to move in a different direction, we would try to partner with um, current staff members and bring them on board and that's what we did in Southboro and we've had great success with that. And not to put you on the spot, but how many students do we have that participate in that program? Yeah. In Southboro, I don't know the last get, count. Yeah. How about here in Northboro? Do we know? A lot. Yeah. <coughs> a lot. Okay. I mean, I. It's always full. Yeah. I, I, I mean, get that. I don't have that. that I, data, I, but I think, think it's a great. Spot for yeah. the numbers. I was just wondering what it was. We can. That's a great okay. question. We can get mm -hmm. data. There is a waiting a list. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I look into the cafeteria. The thing. I had to say at least fifty. Mm. I would think. Just at each school. Yeah, just at, at, you know what I mean? That one school, I would think it's like yeah. 30 or 50 people. I think there is a waiting list. I yeah. think waiting that list. Okay. Um, it is well, well attended, and I think yeah. many of our families appreciate having that type of program available to them. Yeah. And and early school, well, that's the other thing, too, is, is um, sorry, um, I don't think all of our schools do Both. before <laughs> and after school. Correct. So that would be something also something to potentially look into and seeing if there's a need to. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the challenges that we hear from many families is if they move into a neighborhood and the school does not have a before and after school program, it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is something we would look at. Is there a way we can either transport or offer the same level of program at all four of mm -hmm. our schools? I think it also ties back to the conversation around um, kind of district structure mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and neighborhood schools versus yeah, reconfiguration. reconfiguration. Mm -hmm. it's, why is it not at all schools? Is it enrollment? It's or enrollment and staffing like <coughs> and uh, our ability to staff. Okay. But primarily enrollment. Okay. Um, so my question was, um, you know, if we ended up having an in-house program, it would be self-sustaining. Right now, what are the budgetary implications for running it through um, through Northboro Rec? Nothing. Uh, the, currently, they through the licensing agreement, they rent space. Okay. So we receive um, um, rental from them, mm -hmm. and, and we would continue that next year. Okay. So there's no. It's actually a, um, an income for us, okay. and that would continue next year, and then. Again, part of the analysis we would do is to see what the financial implications are. Okay. So all other fees go directly towards them. They run Correct. enrollment There's and things like yeah. that. Okay. Okay. Um, moving on, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, meeting we are going to postpone the multilingual learners data presentation until February. Um, no old business. Question about that on the agenda. What is old business and why do we never have old business? We're probably going to talk about things and then we talk about them again. Yeah, so. I'm missing what that is. Just a comedy bit? <laughs> so, so if there's a, I think if there's new business and then we want to talk about it again, it becomes 
all this. Okay. But I feel like when I always just put it back into the new business, yeah. like I feel like every... Well, we could we could change that practice. You're the chair. Yeah. I feel like maybe it's just business. Let's <laughs> <laughs> talk about any DP again. <laughs> so that's going to go back to the old business then. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, so um, moving on to the superintendent's report, enrollments. So in your packet is the enrollment report as of the 16th of December, um, and we um, had two more students in a row in our district, and I will, will share that we've had a number of students in a row over the past week and a half. So um, enrollment is slowly creeping up. It's something that we're watching very closely for the fiscal year uh, 24 budget. Um, we were hoping at this, our, our projections at this time when we created the class size policy was that um, there was a thought that we'd see declining enrollment and we'd be able to move students back to their neighborhood schools and not the district students. But we're finding that um, the opposite is true. We're actually having to redistrict more students as a result of increased enrollments. Okay. Uh, Greg, would you say the new move-ins that we've had, like in October we had 10 and it's mm -hmm. been decreasing but we still have new enrollments. When those people move into the district, is that, are so those students being redistricted or are some of them be able to take place in their um, area school? I mean, it, it really depends. I think the challenge we typically face is when there are siblings. So most families that move in have more than one child, and, and we find that there might be a school where one grade level is capped and the other isn't, but we have to redistrict because there is a school where there are grade levels that aren't capped at both grade levels. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd say more, most, more often than not, we're redistricting kids at this point. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I know that we usually track close to the NASDAQ projections and things like that, but it just makes me nervous seeing that these grades are capped. So if they're capped now, most likely they're going to be just rolling over to the following year. Those grades are going to be capped, you know. And then how are we going to be with, I mean, looking at the fifth grades, there's only one fifth grade with three yeah, so teachers. So do you know what I mean? So that's only one, do you know what I mean? Like, are we gonna, I feel that we're gonna have um, so we have not, staffing issues. So one of the things we've not done is we've not moved forward staffing. So with a, with three sections meet potentially in a grade level, we haven't moved that three sections to the next grade level. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have a separate sheet for the FY24 where we have those scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the question we ask is do we have space if kids move in, even if we have to redistrict in a particular grade level mm -hmm. um, across our district? And the answer currently is yes, but it's it's becoming tight. Tighter. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm looking at even just mm -hmm. not the redistrict, just in one school, like alone having, you know, full like looking at the kindergarten, first grade at Z, for example, and the second grades, like all those. Yeah, like Z, Z is an specific. example. Z is capped in grade one, grade two. Kindergarten. Um, but it would be moving, yeah, so moving for next year, it would be like yeah. basically and we have one, two, three, four three, is going to be. Three yeah. and five. Yeah. So. Just to keep in mind when we're talking about it. Around grade level configure school configuration, and um, yeah, you know how do we how do we maximize our resources, and how do we provide the best experience for students in a great configuration that works well for the community? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I ask, is that yeah. committee still meeting? We just got it on the email today about that. Yeah, so we're convening um, in January, reconvening mm -hmm. in the um, group identified next level work, uh, so we're going to move forward with that work. The other um, part of that story, too, is the MSBA did open up the window for um, core building submissions January 13th, so we will be submitting a statement of interest for Peasley. 
which I think will enter into the conversation around what does Peasley become. So also in your packet is the FY23 monthly general fund expenditure report. And Becky will share the story. <laughs> <laughs> so the finance team does continue to monitor the Northboro um, operational budget. As you know, it is frozen at this point in time. I have been working with um, directors and also with principals to make sure that any of the, their needs are met, though. Um, so no fear that um, people are not being able to purchase the things that they need in order to operate throughout the, the school year. Um, as a result of the work, though, that we've been doing, you will notice that the monthly general fund report does have three hundred thousand seven hundred and thirty one dollars on the bottom line um, which is just over ninety thousand dollars more than what we had uh, last month um, we're also trending very closely to where we were in the previous two fiscal years. So in FY22, we did have 369,000, and in FY21, we had 327,000. So I do feel like we are at a good place right now. I am able to sleep at night, um, which is always a good sign. And um, everybody has been wonderful in terms of like being accommodating and being very thoughtful about the purchases that they are making. Hmm. Is there anything that um, we're encountering in the schools as far as materials due to the supply chain, uh, paper, tone, or anything like that? Paper continues to be, um, a, a, I don't know, a wild card, I guess we could say. Um, I had this fall, though, we did work with the schools to make sure that they were purchasing what they anticipated they needed for the rest of the school year. Um, and so all of the schools have done that. But it's amazing, um, a pallet of paper that we purchased at the beginning of December. We went on today, and it's $1,000 more for the pallet. So it's just, you know, you really have to shop around and can't rely on one product because it's ever changing so um, you just paper continues to be like the I guess the thorn in my side um, in terms of other supplies though we are able to we have not seen any issues the copier situation has settled down um, we moved to Xerox and so we have been able to get the toner um, that we weren't able to get last year through Konica so um, I, I would say paper is the main thing Seems like every year it's the paper. Yeah, you know what I mean, it's no yeah. matter what school district you're in, it always seems that it's something about the paper. You mm -hmm. know, you come to the short supply. And in education today, that's what you rely upon mm -hmm. with all the good learning styles that we have. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I guess during the pandemic, many of the um, factories closed down and moved to corrugated um, paper or um, cardboard because people weren't purchasing paper. They were all working remotely and everything was being done electronically. And so that's really cut the number of plants that are available to make paper. So it's continued two years later to be an issue. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So I'll just add one comment and that is that principals have done a nice job mm -hmm. monitoring mm -hmm. paper usage um, and looking at making sure that they have enough paper when June arrives, in mm -hmm. May and June. Um, in the past, it really wasn't is an issue. If we needed paper in May, <laughs> we would order paper. Um, but we don't have that luxury right now, A, because if we ordered it, it wouldn't arrive on time, and B, the cost is really prohibitive. So they've um, done a nice job of kind of allocating the resources that they need for the school year. Mm -hmm. And teachers have done a really nice job trying to conserve when, when possible. If you hear that there's no paper and that we can't afford paper, <laughs> um, it's partially true because it's so expensive, but uh, we do have enough paper to, mm -hmm. to, to last through the school year. Mm -hmm. And if not, we'll, we'll order corrugated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop breaking boxes up. <laughs> Ask everybody to bring a ring of paper. Yeah, right? oh boy. <laughs> um, can I have a motion to approve it to audit it? Uh, I move to accept and until audit the Northbrook Public School FY 2023 budget, the monthly general fund expenditure report as of December 31st, 2022. Second. <coughs> Motion by Joan, seconded by Aaron. Uh, any discussion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So next in your packet is the capital project and improvements that approved FY24 capital plan. And I'll just highlight that this Saturday at 8.30 will be um, convening at Z School for a building tour um, from 8.30 to 9.30. And then we'll be traveling to Peasley for a building tour. And then for those who are interested, we will be um, looking at the athletic complex at Algonquin um, as the last stop on, on the building tour. So that is this Saturday. Also, um, we are having conversations with um, Town Administrator Kadera around the Proctor roof. I don't think that the Select Board has made any decisions around the use of ARPA funds, but they do know that the Proctor roof is a top priority in terms of funding that project using um, ARPA funds. Have, have they gone moved forward with anything else like bidding and are we still waiting? No, we're still waiting for, to hear from the select board that that's something they'll fund through To be probably should we should probably follow up on the edge. Yeah. yeah. Make sure that yeah. since it's not like we're waiting for MSB or you know what I mean, but we're not on the time frame anymore, so mm -hmm. we can get that done. So I'll follow up with John tomorrow. Yeah. Um, also in your packet are the FY24 budget goals and FY24 budget calendar. And next is the FY24 revised preliminary budget presentation. So just give me one minute to set up. December meeting, um, as you all know, we pre I presented the FY24 preliminary budget. Um, and typically in January, we would be presenting the superintendent's recommended budget. Um, but this year, due to a variety of factors, um, we are about a month behind schedule. Most, uh, most, mostly due to um, we don't have great information, and we need to let. Um, time pass so we have better data um, to present to the school committee. So my anticipation is that we'll present the recommended budget early in February, and that will be um, the budget that the school committee votes. Um, so I will not um, go through the presentation in its entirety. Um, I'll just comment that, again, we're a mission and vision driven organization, and everything we do is about um, the experience that our students have in the classroom and in our schools, um, the budget process. And again, I just highlighted the fact that typically in January, I'm presenting the superintendent's recommended budget. Um, but this year, we added a new budget, which is the revised preliminary um, budget. And then um, we're marching toward the April town meeting, and I believe it is um, April 24th. It's the last, the last Monday. Last 24th. Monday. Yeah, 24th. Oh, Monday? Is that going to be Monday? Is that what they? Yeah. I don't know. Last week in April. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's April 24th. 24th, yeah. Um, so I think it's important to just revisit the budget variables at this point in time. So we are in the third year of a three-year contract with the Northborough Teachers Association. So we are um, in collective bargaining. Um, this is an unknown in terms of the impact it will have on the FY24 budget. Currently, there are um, assumptions built into the, the revised preliminary budget. Um, but we will not know this number until we have finalized um, negotiating with the Teachers Association. Also, we've spoken about the out-of-district special education uh, tuition increase of 14%. So um, that is a significant amount of money um, added to the FY24 budget that we typically don't see in prior fiscal years. And we're also seeing a significant increase in out-of-district special education transportation costs. Um, and then 
the impact of um, kind of the, the geopolitical climate, increased energy costs, um, the costs of supplies and materials due to inflation and costs of services are all impacting um, the FY24 budget and are considered budget variables at this point in time. Um, so the budget that we are presenting this evening is um, a level services budget in most areas um, with some incremental growth in uh, certain curriculum line items. Um, and basically we're trying to protect the programming that we have um, that students are experiencing in the 22-23 and, and being able to continue those programs uh, in this upcoming academic year. Um, but really the budget does not um, add additional programming at this point in time just due to the fiscal climate that we're in at this point in time. So approved budget goals, so again, these are essential in the work that we do as we make decisions around what to include or not include in our budget. These budget goals are essential. And where are we in terms of the budget process? So in December, we presented the preliminary budget, um, in which represented 11.01% increase. So it was a $1.3 million increase over fiscal year 23. Um, the operational budget subcommittee met um, prior to December break um, and provided us with some direction. Um, as a result, the leadership team um, looked at the budget very closely and came up with um, a little over $1.5 million in reductions um, to bring in this revised preliminary budget to 5.9%. And again, this preliminary budget includes many assumptions at this point in time. Again, comparing to um, where we were in the fiscal year 23 budget process at the same time last year, as you can see, the preliminary budget came in at 4.4%. And um, we move forward with a superintendent's recommended budget at 3.46%. So we are in a very different fiscal uh, position than we were at this time last year. Just commenting on what is a 1% increase to the budget. So um, a 1% increase over our fiscal year 23 is a little over $250,000. So this is a good kind of benchmark when we're gauging um, what impact line items have on the overall um, FY24 budget. So um, this table shows what the budget drivers um, are um, from the preliminary presented in December to the revised preliminary. So out of district collaborative and tuitions, um, working closely with special education and student support services, um, we have a revised preliminary um, budget of $529,999 um, compared to the preliminary um, of a little over $1 million that was presented last month. Um, that is looking very closely at um, out of district placements, um, looking at the use of circuit breaker and, and some other factors that are in play at this point in time. Um, transportation special education, so um, student support services and the finance team looked very closely at projecting transportation costs um, and as a result um, was able to revise the preliminary budget um, um, decreased by about $100,000. Salary increases in COLAs, again this is an unknown, so at this point in time we're um, our assumption is that the revised preliminary uh, salary increases is going to be a little over $718,000. Electricity and heating uh, that has not changed since the preliminary and substitutes, nurses, teachers, and leave of absences has not changed as well. So the revised preliminary budget drivers total a little over $1.6 million. Could you just clarify that transportation um, number? Um, and so the preliminary 
So the revised preliminary has gone down, has Correct. decreased? Okay. Yeah. I think the version we had, the numbers were just flipped. Yes. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that <laughs> the, these are the correct ones. These are the correct ones. Yes. So yeah, we, went, correct. we went in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's decreasing that cost. Okay. I also saw, I saw a lot of yeah. look at the first mine saying those numbers don't drive with what we have. So could we get a the copy of this new sheet? This is hot off the press. Mm -hmm. That's <laughs> what I like. Hot off the press. <laughs> Yes, we will um, send this off to you um, after the meetings. So okay, thank you. It just shows that our budget is always involving and you're always <laughs> working at it and racing and everything. Thank you. I think one of the challenges we, um, that we're facing this year is that the December meeting was very early in December and the January meeting is very early <coughs> in January. So with the December break, it, it, it's a moving target. Um, yeah trying to get this budget to mm -hmm. the committee at this point in time. So budget offsets. So um, the preliminary budget um, for Circuit Breaker was a little over $900,000 for an offset. Our revised preliminary is $1.1 million, and this assumes that we're going to use some of the fiscal year 23 Circuit Breaker to um, fund next year's budget. Um, the uh, finance department has done a nice job looking at um, long-term trends and looking at when students will be aging out of programs. Um, which in fiscal year 25, that is our projection. So um, based on those projections, we felt comfortable um, applying some of the uh, circuit breaker um, reimbursement to this fiscal year 24 budget. Um, circuit breaker or special education transportation offset. This is from the Student Opportunity Act, so that has not changed from the last budget presentation. And then potential retirements and leave of absences. So preliminary was 84,000, and um, this actually increased to $163,000. This just speaks to the fact that providing more time gives us better numbers about who might be not returning or might be taking a leave of absence. This date is January 15th, so there are still additional um, if information we could receive from faculty and staff about retirements or a leave of absence request for fiscal year 24. So from the preliminary to the revised um, increased um, offsets increased by about $300,000. So um, budget offsets. And these are new offsets um, from the last uh, budget that we had presented to you. Um, so you can see that we ha we had not taken these into consideration in December, but um, we have accounted for a revised um, offset in the salaries and increases in the COLAs of about 200000 um, we're also looking at um, some unit A position um, reductions um, at about 140,000, um, utilizing our ESSER 3 funds um, that we still have available at 150,000. And then um, we've also, um, Marie and I have been working closely on the North Road budget, and we've looked at um, some of the um, special education um, lines, um, tuition, and then we've made some transportation adjustments based on some new information that we received a student who is going to be graduating at the end of the year that we weren't sure and so we've been able to achieve some savings um, of about 590,000 so these are additional offsets that have come in in the past month and as a result um, the recommended FY 24 budget or the revised preliminary is $28,268,510, which um, is a uh, budget increase of 5.9% or $1,575,557. Um, so the, the town's target um, was about 3.5%. So we're about $600,000 over the, the town's target. <coughs> However, at this point in time, um, if we go back and look at some of the budget drivers, um, you know, just out of district tuition, just two, a 2% two increase, um, salary increases in COLAs is, is about a 3% increase. Um, so if you look at the 5.9% um, increase, percent increase, um, it's primarily special education 
COLAs, cost of living adjustments, salaries, and electricity costs. Um, so it's not adding anything extravagant to our budget. So, um, so fiscal year 2024 impact of reductions. Um, so I think this preliminary, revised preliminary uh, has some assumptions. So the assumption is that w we would reduce three unit A positions. So educator positions, we don't know what those positions are. Um, and this is where time will help us if we find out about a re retirement. But at some point we'll have to um, get a sense of what these positions would, would be and what impact they would have to students. We've had some internal conversations, but we're not, at this point in time, I'm ready to share any detailed information with the committee um, or the community. Um, utilization of FY24 circuit breaker funds. Um, so if we use FY24 circuit breaker funds in FY24, um, typically we use the second year of circuit breaker to have a known number when we do the budgeting for the upcoming fiscal year, which has been very helpful. This potentially could impact um, that process uh, moving forward. Um, we're going to have to uh, amend ESSER 3 um, to change what we said we would accomplish with ESSER 3 funds. Um, so um, we would do a, an amendment to the is grant. That do from, is that funding through the state? Does that have to do that? Every year we have to do a, a progress update. So we would have to um, do a <coughs> progress update and request an amendment. And then lastly, um, utilization of IDEA special education, special education grant for transportation. So we receive a federal grant um, that we would use to offset trans increase transportation costs. So these are the um, impact of the budget reductions. And these are staffing requests that um, were requested by principals, but again are not included in this revised preliminary budget. Um, we were asked to prioritize these positions. Um, so um, principals and directors worked closely together uh, and came up with this prioritized list. The top three priorities for um, the team, the first is mathematic interventionists, one interventionist in each building, um, an educator support professional, 2.0 um, preschool students moving into CASEL programs, and then um, a math uh, educator um, to create a math coaching or math intervention model at Malican School. Um, I will share that the, F the team chair was budgeted in the FY23 budget, um, but because of the two additional educators we added, we held on that position and have not filled it. Um, and that continues to be a priority, but did not make the top three. Um, and as you can see, um, I know that a, a strong priority for the school committee was adding the elementary strings program. Um, we've not given up hope on that. We have some ideas of how we can make that happen. We've been working with the music department. Um, we received a proposal um, over December break. We're reviewing that proposal and we're also letting some other um, information kind of play out before we make any recommendation around whether that's feasible in this this fiscal year uh, 24 budget so again the 15.28 requested full-time equivalent positions that never made it into the um, fy24 preliminary budget and still remain out of the budget at this point in time Um, so instructional materials, so we did move um, some instructional materials. This has not changed since uh, the preliminary budget. Um, middle school science, um, middle school and elementary math curriculum, and then student and staff devices. So this is ESSER 3 uh, funded. And also a shift from the preliminary budget um, not included in the budget, um, the strengths program. ELA K through five curriculum and professional development, ST math K through five screening and kindergarten curriculum. We did learn of a 
um, state grant where they would um, fund 50% of the ELA K through five curriculum. So, Dr. Reinhorn and um, Megan Kelty are working on looking at that grant very closely, um, and we're going to pr pursue that um, actively. So they would do 50%, but we'd have to come up with the other 50. Yeah. Percent. So I think the other and which is not in the budget. Which is not in the budget. Yeah. We are also. Um, Stephanie is working very closely with the vendors and trying to get the best price possible and talking about, you know, what what is the actual cost. So we spoke about the 190 is really the ceiling. It's the most expensive it would be. And we're getting better data around what the actual cost is. And then with a 50% um, state matching, if we do get that grant, it is something that we feel could be feasible moving forward in this um, FY24. And it is um, a high priority for us. These requests um, total $230,000, um, and we are fine-tuning these numbers as well. Um, and we are making every effort to try to include these in the, um, the recommended budget that will be presented in February. And revised preliminary, again, um, we look at the historical appropriated budget percent increases, you know, we've been very conservative. We've uh, worked very closely with the town and, and brought in budgets within kind of the town confines. Um, and this year, we're finding it extremely difficult to even um, bring in a 6% a budget that doesn't have some reductions in, in staffing. Um, so it's a very different economic climate than we've experienced over the past I would say 10 years, decade. And again, if you look at inflation, although it is trending in the right direction, um, a 6% budget doesn't even keep up with inflation um, at this point in time. So that is the revised preliminary um, budget. We have a lot more work to do, um, a lot more data to collect in more questions to answer before we're ready to present our recommended budget to the school committee in February. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Erin? You know what I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, I guess my biggest concern is reduction of staff. After we just talked about we're busting at the seams. Like that is Classes. not what I expected at all. I was very surprised to that. Yeah, and without, and I will say that without, without one of the challenges that we have is that we don't want to share some of the internal conversations that we're having because they impact people, and mm -hmm. we're not. I'm not confident <laughs> at this point. This this is going to change without having. Um, if we were to share scenarios with the school committee, it would potentially could make people uneasy. Mm, <laughs> um, so I guess my point is that there's a lot of thought um, that went into those the, the potential positions. And our, our goal is always tr to try to minimize the impact of the experience students are having. So more information to share as we move forward. What would our budget, this is kind of putting you on the spot, but what would it be if you didn't reduce those three? <coughs> I think it was one four. Is that wasn't there a line item there? It's about seventy thousand dollars for each position. So one's going to be six forty-three um, for for the one forty. Six point four three. Six forty. Yep. Six point four three. Sorry. Six point four three percent. And then there was another. Yeah. Uh, six tenths of a percent, right? Five point nine, and it would be six point four. Yep. And then, um, and then there was. So um, there was another position in another line, so that would actually bring it up to six point eight eight. So a percentage point. So one that makes sense. Okay. 
you wouldn't recommend that budget? I'm not, I, we don't have enough information to make a recommended budget at this point in time. Yeah. I, th I will share that getting to 5.9% was not easy. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I was going to make a joke. It's not the time to mm -hmm. make a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I know that Becky can maybe sleep because of our current budget, but you're probably not sleeping over this budget, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that you're probably still not sleeping. Um, uh, so a few sort of clarifying questions. Um, so the use of that circuit breaker money, can I just clarify? So typically that seems like it wouldn't be a smart financial decision, but the reason why we're saying it could be done is because of um, a decrease in special ed costs for our next fiscal year. Is that correct? So, and that's a, someone who's graduating, so we will not be having those... Um, we will not need funds like in, in future years potentially. Yeah. Does that make sense? In FY25, and Marie, feel free to jump in, but we have a number of students who are either aging out or graduating. Okay. Um, and so we've taken those um, into consideration when we've looked at forecasting ahead okay. um, for FY25. Okay. Because my, my worry would be, you know, we, we use Circuit Breaker now, mm -hmm. and then what sort of pattern do we get into mm -hmm. um, and do we sort of get stuck so but it sounds like with the trends we would be able to sort of get out of that pattern of using the circuit breaker money f for that reason Hopefully. the hope would be that yes okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I'll just comment too that I would say that the amount of circuit breaker that we'd be applying to the FY24 budget I would characterize as conservative mm -hmm. okay so it, it, we are not, it, uh, it's a fraction of circuit breaker, not, it's not half, mm -hmm. it's not three quarters, so it's a measured approach. Okay. So sort of along the same lines, using the SR3 money, um, I know that we have a practice of not using one-time funds for operational budget expenses typically. Um, the, the list that was presented, are those all like one-time costs that we will just need to incur on our operational budget for next year? Yes, yeah, so, so with ESSER 3 and, and grant funds that we receive, we purchase uh, materials and supplies mm -hmm. versus adding positions. So okay. all of these items fall within what we typically um, would use grant funding for. Okay. And does not create a structural deficit for us. Okay. What was the, the you were allocating from? So we you know, had, um, we had, I mean, from like the ESSER. So, like, you know how you said you so we are wanted to go one way, but now we are going to end up to go. For example, we had money for um, Red Cat audio systems for our classrooms. Okay. So, that is something that um, we feel like these are more of a priority than the Red Cat audio systems, as an example. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yes, John. On that uh, slide that you're showing right now, the bottom one, student and staff devices. Is this replenishing technology due to where, due to have updates have to be onto it, and even just increase enrollment? I mean, we've never really, I don't think, have had extra laptops sitting around. So if we talk about we're getting new students every month, those are devices those students need to have. Correct. This. Um, aligns with our staff and device replace and student device replacement plan so this replaces all the devices that are aging out and we need to replace those devices because they no longer work with for example next generation MCAS testing mm -hmm. so we have no choice but to stay current with our student and staff devices and stay current with our plan yeah I didn't realize John when I I had to buy one for a PTO raffle gift um, a Chromebook I didn't realize that they literally have expiration dates in them that after a certain date, you can't even update the software on the things. It's like phones. It's, it's, like, it's like worse than phones. I mean, hello, I have a seven. I mean, yes, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, I'm like, it's like, yeah. like, at least I, well, my phone's not updated, you know, because I thought about it. But it's the same, but you can't, if you they won't work after a certain date. Mm -hmm. and, and they're not that long of 
It's like three or four right. years, right? It's three or four years. I think. So what if I built max? Like you're lucky if you find one with five, you know. So And that is something that is really needed because the MCAS test that comes in the springtime is done via the technology. So we don't even have a choice. Mm -mm. And it isn't anything I hate to say fluff, because people would say sometimes, well what's the fluff mm -hmm. you know? And there isn't and and just going on to what Aaron had said, when I look at the staffing requests that are not in the budget, I don't see any that are, oh, this would be our wish list. It isn't a wish list, it's a need list that we need in that staffing, especially as we're coming off the pandemic. Um, you know, we're coming to the point now where you hear about what all the schools and the MCAS scores and that, is that some kids lost a whole year. And I'm concerned about the elementary grade levels when they, some of the kids didn't learn their multiplication tables at the end of third grade and they were pushed on to fourth grade. All of these, and some, I would say some of them, I won't say majority, are a result of the pandemic. We, pandemic. The results of that, of coming down, of you know, having remote learning and not having a continual whole year in school and, and you know, doing that is, you know, you have your math tutors, you have your reading tutors. Um, you even have your team chair, which I know is a very important part of our special ed program to have. So, you know, it, it's a shame that we are in the position we are at, and I just applaud the administration and the principals and the teachers for still working extra hard that they are doing to get these kids up without the need list of what we need in our classrooms. So I don't know how we as a committee go ahead and sooner than later do we meet with with John do we try to educate people <coughs> on what our needs are and what we're facing yeah I mean I think that the purpose of the financial trend monitoring meeting is really to provide kind of the larger context there is regardless of whether we want to bring a 25 percent budget forward or not there's a fixed amount a fixed pool of money Mm -hmm. um, I think a 6% budget is is pushing that envelope. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this, these requests alone uh, represent a 4% increase mm -hmm. on to the 5.9. <coughs> and I know that we won't get those positions. I know we cannot go up to a 10% budget. I know that's not going to happen, but I think it's a, a matter of what is the what is the um, number one priority? The in those, I mean, I, John made a really good point about with COVID and the step back of the kids, and I mean, math interventions. I think that sounds like something else. I'd love to see if we could somehow add that. Like, if we have the five nine, mm -hmm. if we added that on top of the five nine, what would that? What's a What's, what is that, 300,000? What is that percentage wise? Uh, percent and a half. Uh, percent and. Yeah, about a, a percent quarter. and a half. 266 is 1%. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we can. But you're also taking three staff away. Well, that's the that's four. Right. Right. So now you're talking about uh, keeping seven. Mm -hmm. I see that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, and, and again, the, the reduction of staff, I'm seeing it more as it could be potentially like a retirement, and now we're getting in something there. So it's like, it's a reduction in the staff versus like. Those are already factored in. Okay. The three positions would be elimination of three positions. Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the strategies we could take is, again, this is a revised preliminary we, we still need more time to get a better yeah. data set is we could start with trying to restore the three positions start there and then the first priority once we get to that point is adding the interventionists mm. I just see maybe that two instead of yeah, yeah maybe start and split it so I just see as something um, kids are going to keep sliding if we don't have things. I mean, we, we have our reading. It seems like our reading has been built up. We've been working on that for the past few years. It seems like math is, you know, we need to be pushing the math up as well. I know we're working on the, the 
the new math software, things like that, the curriculum for it. Um, I just, well, my fear is the, the longer we keep putting things off, it's never going to get easier. It's never going to buy. And I feel like, like, look, at it's down on, like, the list for the team chiller, which we approved last year. We had it in our budget. We were all excited. We got the team chiller. Like, so, and, and now, all of a sudden, it's not even, we haven't even got what we wanted and needed. And yeah, I think, though, I would just, also yeah. argue that, yes, I agree with you, but at the same time, the challenge with enrollment is we can't budget. It's hard to budget what if scenarios mm. you know we can't add two positions just in case enrollment increases by <laughs> what whatever so we have to we have to build a budget on the best data we have at the time we're building the budget and then react to what comes at us and that is conversations with the town that hey we can't control enrollment mm. we presented a fiscally responsible budget, but we increased enrollment by 50 students. Therefore, we need additional funding. I think, you know, I think in Westboro, I think there was an, an article in the a community advocate that they had to go to the town and ask for a million dollars as a result of mm -hmm. um, special education. Mm -hmm. So we're not the only district that's experiencing <coughs> increased costs in special education. If we took special education increased costs out of the equation, we would be having a conversation of what other programs could we add. However, we have a responsibility to all students, including special ed students, and um, some of the students require uh, programming that is really expensive, but that's what they require at this point in time. Um, so a couple of things I just wanted to uh, go back to. So first of all, you know that um, I am a strong supporter of the strings program being reinstated in the town of Northboro. Um, I think that the music study group did a great job, um, you know, collecting data and surveys and sort of figuring out the needs and, and desires of our community. Um, additionally, sitting here and hearing that they're could be a potential reduction of positions that currently exist in our town, in our district. Um, you know, it feels a little bit silly to say, oh, you know, we want this strings program too, right? Because um, sometimes it's hard to have it all. So if there are creative solutions to finding funds, like those, those the grant funding um, for certain things, I think that that could be an avenue. I know you're working maybe behind the scenes a little bit. Um, I'm still an advocate for it for music and for the strings program um, but again I think sometimes reality hits of you know here's what we're faced with um, I do agree that the reduction of the positions is not something that I I, I like and, and would support um, unless it was the only option um, to get our budget passed which brings me to you know passing a budget so we have a few more obstacles to go obviously we need to pass a budget mm -hmm. and then we need to go through the town's process so I, I think what I'm worried about is even looking at the 5.9 and then hearing what we're saying tonight about even maybe wanting a little bit more is where do we think that town's approval level is um, in terms of getting approval from appropriations finance and then town meeting um, and what are next steps if it a doesn't pass? Um, financial implications for the taxpayers as well. And these are big, big questions that I think we haven't really had to face the last few years. That I think are are important questions to answer. I don't mean to just throw all these questions at you tonight, but I think all that information will be so helpful because we have a huge decision ahead of us in February. Um, so that information is going to be super helpful if you can try to gather that. Yeah, I think I think. Those are great points, and it is a budget process. Mm -hmm. So I think we are in on the journey right now. So right. you know we do have to present to the town boards and committees and, right. and make sure they have good information. We are one member, one department in many departments. We are also the largest budget, so you know we have to we have to look at the larger context of what the town looks like um, fiscally. Um, I think we got a small picture in uh, with the financial trend monitoring presentation um, and I think in the next 
four to six weeks, um, we'll have better data, we'll have opportunities to collaborate and partner with the town boards and committees. Um, and then at some point, the committee will have to make a decision that mm -hmm. this is an educationally sound budget that we need to move forward with. That's your job, it's my job, um, even if it is outside the constraints of um, what what is allocated. But yes, yeah, so I will get you the yeah. process. I, we'll talk about process okay. and that what that helpful. looks like and, I and think how do we move forward. I just wouldn't want to go to town meeting, have our budget not pass, go back to the drawing board. I really want to come out with a strong budget that is educationally sound, yeah. hopefully fiscally responsible as much as we can be. Um, and I don't, I don't think, I mean, I, history, I don't think we would, I think we're going to be able to, whatever we present, we'll get it to be able to pass and we'll have the other committees supporting us because of the story we need to tell them and we need to lay out the facts and show them, like, this is historically where we've been, this is where we want to go. I mean, part of it that you want people to come and move into our community we want families and families to move in. We want them to move into our school districts where we need to be a thriving school district. We need to, you know, be able to support the families. So. I mean, part of the story, too, is that, you know, in FY21, you know, we moved forward a 1% budget mm -hmm. because of the context and the circumstance. So when you move forward a 1% budget, it compounds over a year, you mm -hmm. know. You, it, you're not building upon a 3% budget or a 4% budget. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the same with fiscal year 22. So I think part of the story is that historically we've we've been able to bring in budgets that are educationally sound and fiscally responsible. Um, and we are too, this year. Mm -hmm. Just potentially not within. <laughs> not as. Yeah, I think that's a really important part of the story is yeah. those three years that were s under that, you know, 3% kind of target has a ripple yeah. effect, yeah. and that's where we are now. Yeah. <coughs> and I think any time... Yeah. And I will also just comment that inflation, mm. yeah. as, as much as it is, you know, we've never had inflation impact the, the prior five-year fiscal budgets, the way yeah. uh, just $135,000 in increased electricity costs. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a half a percent. And that's a big part of the story too, is that this budget does not include anything new. Correct. Mm -hmm. Nothing. And when you have that 1%, one year, you have that one percent. It takes a long time to overcome it. It's like, in the uh, historically, when we've had cuts in in st in staff, especially at the high school, is it's taken a long time to get those back in and restored. I don't know the cuts that we had. We ever we really restored hundred percent of those cuts because it takes so well, much. You know, I would also say that in FY in fiscal year twenty three, that appropriated budget, um, I think there were incremental growth. Um, we added an instructional technology specialist, but that was that was really putting back in place what we had to take out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were we were starting to make incre incremental growth. Um, I think the, my recommendation to the committee and the work that we're trying to do is to um, move forward a level services budget with a few areas where we're moving the needle mm -hmm. or we're adding um, some programming for students. When I applaud Stephanie and her staff members helping you doing that grant, no matter what money it is, I know grant writing is not an easy process, but anything that you can do is just so helpful. So thank you for taking that initiative. And I'm sure kudos to you also because you've also done that. She does a great job at grant writing. <laughs> I'm a great, I'm a great chaser. <laughs> Historian chaser. <laughs> Mm. So my recommendation for next steps is that I think that we should have a school a working set school committee session, so a meeting, mm. where we're just working on the budget and helping us as a leadership team um, 
giving us some more direction. Um, this is a unique budget year, and we all need to be on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, I'd suggest if we could do it after the 15th, so we have a few more. Mm -hmm. Ideally, after the 26th. Oh, I was going to say, <laughs> or, or, yeah, maybe, maybe early February, but is that going to push the February meeting then? How does that? And the uh, February meeting. It's it early, is, too, I think. It's yeah. the first. It's literally on the, the first. first. Yeah, I think, I think um, that's too late. Mm. Is that a meeting that would be open to the community? So, like, would that be an open session? Yeah, I mean, any meeting is yeah. open to yeah. the community. It's just not like necessarily that would be a great thing to put out there so that people can really come and hear what we're dealing with. <coughs> I mean, all all meetings, questions. people are welcome to come to. Well, I meant like it's going to be in person or do well, virtual. It would be, be in person. Yeah. I mean, I, in my mind, this is how it looks. Yeah. It would be in person. Okay. It, it would be one one topic yes <laughs> on the agenda it wouldn't be on in sharing it would be a time for us to work through some of the decisions that we need to make mm -hmm. um, so anyone could could listen in and um, but really my thinking is it would be an opportunity for the committee to do its budget work and be a business meeting I think the recommended budget we could we could share some of this, this the backstory around how did we how did we get to this budget what's the process and then obviously there is a public hearing for the budget um, as we move forward in the process but just this conversation is helpful we have some some work we have some direction and some work to do just from this conversation Um, moving on, so, uh, school committee uh, member reports. I'll start at the end of the table. Lauren, anything? Nothing. Joan? Uh, yes, I have one. Um, it was a meeting that I attended for the NSPAC officers as an alternate for Kelly and for Bryce. And uh, just so, Kelly, for your um, information, the next meeting is going to be January the 19th. That's a virtual meeting. Mm -hmm. And following that is February 16th and that's an in-person meeting. I'd also like to mention that at the December 16th meeting, uh, our superintendent, Greg Martin, was in attendance, and so was Marie Allen, our director of special ed. So Marie, if I make my report and I say something longer, Greg, just go like this. Okay, so it was a great meeting, uh, great in attendance. Um, some of the things that they came up with were that they have their work and they're relating it to the strategic plan. So anytime I hear uh, an organization or a department or a group that's working together and working with a strategic plan, I like to have that happen because I think it, many times that strategic plan, sometimes ours doesn't, and I think, but sometimes it just, it's, it's done and it's put away and put on a shelf, but ours is a very uh, livable, uh, up-to-date pr uh, program. Um, they also talked, there was items requested by the NSPAC officers, and one was the MCAS scores, and I saw Stephanie that um, it, one of the upcoming agenda items that we have is going to be on MCAS presentation. So, Paula, maybe at the next meeting you can give them an update of the, when the MCAS is going to be given. Um, they, wanted, they also talked about a new IEP format that's coming out from DESE. So, they talked about that. And they also talked about peer acceptance and social inclusion training. So Marie brought them up to date. It was nice to hear their questions. It's the first time I attended one of these meetings. And it was nice to see that their questions and the dialogue that was going back and forth between Greg and Marie and, and enlighten them on the information that you had and answered their questions. So I really appreciated that. Um, they also talked about, you talked about the inclusion audit. It is in place, it's in the practices around inclusion services and their practices, and everyone agreed that it was a meaning, meaningful experience to go through. So it's amazing to hear that when somebody goes through an audit, everybody goes, eh, but you thought that it was a very meaningful um, experience to go through. And the other thing they wanted to know was the UDL Explorers. 
they wanted information on initiatives, timelines, and what that was going to be going forward. So that's one of the curriculum and issues that you were talking about, Greg, the UDL. Um, so it was a great meeting, and um, I was glad to serve as an alternate to be there. So thank you very much. Thanks, um, Health and Wellness Committee, um, we didn't meet in December, but we'll be meeting in January and planning Wellness Week for 2023, um, and then presenting to the school committee in March. <coughs> okay, thank you. Um, one for me at this time. Um, there is upcoming meetings on the calendar for other committees. So the Coalition for Equity is meeting a week from this Thursday, and also the Coalition formed a, calendar, a calendaring advisory group, so um, that group will be meeting on virtually Tuesday. on Tuesday at 4 o'clock to discuss the 23-24 student calendar. And I am going to be present for that, okay. so I'll be able to represent the school committee. Okay. Thank you. I'll be there too. Okay, great. And it was going to be in person, now it's virtual, right? Virtual. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Oh, okay. The 10th is virtual? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah, and then the <coughs> high school configuration will be on the 24th. Yep, in person. In person. For now. <laughs> Never know. Um, the one thing about NSPAC, though, um, I did go to their holiday thing, and they um, did appoint a new member, um, and it's jo Jolene. Okay. Jo what's Jolene? Who's the new member of NSPAC? Okay, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like looking up. I was like, I, I know it's Jolene, um, but I'm drawing a blank on her last name. So <laughs> Anyways, when we're done, when I when I when it comes to me, which I'm not well, I will announce it. Um, <sighs> educational policy. Um, do we have? There's none at this time. Do we have a schedule? Um, January thirtieth. There's a joint. Um, policy subcommittee meeting so um, I'm in the process of finalizing my monthly report to the committee so that will be outlined in the report okay so the what it, yeah. January 30th yeah so but the just to be clear of what I'm looking yeah. so every policy in our whole handbook oh, yes. everybody looks at the bottom of it it says it was established created reviewed and I remember like a few years ago seeing like a spreadsheet that Cheryl had of all the policies and the years they were established and the years that they were reviewed and kind of like all that. Mm -hmm. So that's the yes. The, that's the calendar that I think would be helpful to bring up and see. Um, just knowing that there's a few policies that we've talked about recently that. Um, people are like, well, wh why is this policy? Why is it and hasn't written? And it's like, well, there's a timeline, there's a time frame, so. So I did, um, Cheryl and I did talk, and yep. um, what we are going to do is, um, we do have a notes column we're going to hide, mm -hmm. and we're going to publish th that to our school committee policy page. Okay. So for those people who are interested in we're looking We're curious at when something's going to be up there. Perfect. Yep. Um, Joelle Gilmore. Thank you. Yes. My watch told me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's it. All right. Um, so that's the policies. No distribution for any new policies at this time. Um, personal distribution of personal reports. So in your packet is the personal report as of January 4th, 2023. And we had some success appointing ESPs. Um, and we did have one resignation of retirement, uh, Linda Budenhagen, who is an ESP, Speech and Language Pathology Assistant, at Lincoln Street School, and she'll be retiring at the end of the year. So we'll have an opportunity to celebrate and honor all our retirees um, as the end of the year draws near. Nice. Communication. So um, in your packet is a letter uh, of 
um, from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education regarding um, a determination um, under Part B that is required for our student support services department as a result of IDEA. Um, and the finding was that um, we met all requirements um, in the performance uh, plan. Um, so there's no corrective action that we need to take at this point in time. So it was good news. It's great news. <coughs> and next month, also, Marie will be speaking about the um, tiered focus monitoring um, audit that we, we will be um, beginning this year, preparing for, and starting next year. So she will provide an update on that as well. I know that was another question that Ennis Pack had around auditing of student support mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. um, so we have action on minutes. <clears throat> we have um, a special meeting, open meeting of December 1st. We have an open meeting from December 7th. And then we've got two separate um, executive sessions. One's a special meeting executive session and then one was executive session. Do you hear any motion? Uh, we can do the top two and then the bottom two. And with executive session then it's We're retained. 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 Right. I'd like to make a motion. <coughs> yes, John. Um, I'm going to uh, do the motion for number one and number two since they're open meeting minutes. I move to accept the uh, special open meeting minutes of December 1st, 2022, and the uh, minutes from the open meeting of December 7th, 2022. Second. Motion by Jones, seconded by Aaron. Um, any discussion? No? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to accept and retain the minutes from the special meeting of December 1st, 2022, and the executive session minutes of December 7th, 2022. Second. Okay. A motion by John, seconded by Erin. Any discussion? No discussion. All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And all the future agenda items, new business. So the only item um, that I could see is the multilingual learner data presentation from Mrs. Webb. Mm -hmm. It'll be a busy month. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Approval and bills um, are happening online. I just signed some today, I believe. Um, just need one more signature. Oh, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> um, okay, uh, audience sharing? Mm, seeing none. Uh, huh? I, have a, I request yes. through audience sharing. Um, Greg, seeing that we had the recommended budget and that you'd be doing a more in depth detail of it, I think it would be helpful at that time is if maybe through your office extend to um, the Board of Selectmen, Mitch Cohen, and the Chairman, and make a special invitation if he would like to attend and the other members. I think it would be very helpful for them to be here and then, you know, they can ask any questions as we get through through the Chair if she wanted to, you know, wait until the end or if they had any questions they could ask at the end of the presentation. But I think if they know, I think, I think we have to get, tell them how important this is to us. I almost wonder too if, um, if when we make the agenda, if we know they're going to be intended, or we move it up in the the, 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 the agenda. So we yeah, almost right. like start right off, you know, right. Right. so it's right in the beginning, and then mm -hmm. um, so we can make a note of that to reorder the yeah, whether it's the. Would it be the February or March? I guess we have February. Yeah. And also, if making you know the, the decision between you and Kelly is also see if the other financial boards want to be in attendance. Just 
give them the information. I mean, you could put the information out there, right? Okay. Let them know that we will be discussing mm -hmm. our budget first. Right. For the evening. It's mm. a good idea, Joe. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have no other new business. Um, no other business to come before tonight. Um, I have a motion to adjourn to executive session. Um, we will not be returning to open meeting. Um, so do you want me to move that? So I move to um, head to executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining with Northboro Teachers Association um, Unit A due to the chair's determination that a discussion regarding this matter in open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the position of the committee with no intent to return to open meeting. Second. Motion by Lauren, seconded by John. Uh, roll call vote. Lauren? Yes. John? Yes. Anne? Yes. Myself, Kelly? Yes. So um, at 8.05, we will adjourn into executive session. Thank you so much. <laughs>